My name is Michael Cooper. I'm one of the vascular surgeons at the University of Florida. So how many people know what a vascular surgeon is? All right, <laughs> everybody. All okay. right, great. Um, yeah, so I'm basically like a plumber for blood vessels. I fix leaky ones. I fix clogged ones. Um, so thank you for coming and giving me the opportunity to talk about a really important and potentially lethal uh, disease, abdominal aortic aneurysms, if not detected and treated. It's not wanting to advance for students. Think about that. There we go. Maybe. All right. <laughs> so, what is the aorta? So, uh, you know, in speaking to my family, we're all non medical. Yeah, you know, I said, what is the aorta? They said, oh, it's by the heart. And, you know, everybody wants to give the cardiac surgeons all the glory, but the aorta is actually. I can't use the clicker. <laughs> the aorta is actually the. Um, I will tell you in a minute. Let's make it bigger. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the aorta is actually the biggest blood vessel in the body. So it comes all the way from the heart here, and it gives off all the major branches to the body. So your carotid arteries, the arteries that go to your arm, all the blood vessels that go down through your chest, your spinal cord, the blood vessels in your abdomen, to your intestines, and to your kidneys. Uh, this is your inferior mesenteric artery, so something to play later. And then it branches ultimately into your iliac arteries, which give the flow to your uh, pelvis and, um, and legs. And today we're gonna focus on the abdominal. So they were down in your abdomen, in your belly. So what is an aneurysm? An aneurysm is when there's an imbalance in the cells that are, uh, break tissues down, the proteases, and in cells that prevent that, the inhibitors. What does this mean in a blood vessel? Well, this is a normal blood vessel, which is a nice circular muscular thing that pumps blood through. And it has these three solid walls. As those cells get broken down, this gets bigger and thinner and becomes what we call an aneurysm. So a normal size of an aorta is less than two centimeters, so about the size of a grape, okay? It becomes an aneurysm when that's bigger than three centimeters. Why does that matter? Well, if you think about having the same amount of cells, if you think of it like a balloon or a piece of bubble gum, as it gets bigger and bigger, that wall gets thinner and thinner, and eventually it pops. And that's what we call a rupture. If that happens to you, if your aorta ruptures, there's an 80% chance you'll die if it's not been treated. So that's why we call it the silent killer. How do we determine risk? So if you think about that balloon blowing up, you know, as the wall gets thinner, is how the, the risk of it rupturing gets higher. So we look at dynamic. And when it really starts to get more dangerous what is when it gets to about five centimeters or uh, a little over two inches, or about the size of a lime. So it's really small. So you think about that down in your belly, you're not gonna feel it, you're not gonna know it's there. People think they're huge, but they're actually quite small. <laughs> Who's at risk? Smokers. If you've smoked more than 100 cigarettes in your life, which is less than 10 packs, you're at a 10 times increased risk. And kind of like everything, increased age increases your risk. <laughs> so, and gentlemen in the room, I'm sorry, but you are four times more likely to develop aneurysms. And if you have a family history of aneurysms, so anybody in here have a family history of aneurysms? Yeah. So if you have a media family with aneurysms, you're at a 20% increased risk. <clears throat> so how will you know you have an aneurysm? You probably won't <laughs> unless you've been screened. So it's time to go and talk to your primary care doctor. We have good screening programs in the United States and good access to it. So when do we screen people? So the, there's some disagreement in the medical community. The Society for Vascular Surgery, which is my kind of governing body, says that every patient, everybody between 65 and 75 who smoked more than 100 cigarettes, should get a one-time screening. 
Um, however, because men are at such higher risk and because of this disagreement within the medical community, currently the standard of care is to screen men. But women with certain risk factors can also be screened. So as a part of your welcome to Medicare package, um, you do get a one-time screening. Um, for men 65 to 75 with a history of tobacco use and for patients with a family history of trouble. <clears throat> However, importantly, only 15% of eligible patients are screened. So 85% of people who are eligible for this free screening with your primary care doctor are not screened. And so they have this silent ticking time. So make sure to talk to your PCP. So how do we screen people? We use uh, ultrasound. Um, so this is actually one of our technologies um, showing how this is done. The great thing about this, no needles, no injections, totally minimally invasive. Uh, the only thing is you don't, you can't eat right before you go in because that can create a lot of bowel gas that can cloud them. Go get a, go get a, a, a croissant at Ogre's. But um, this is, this is what it actually looks like. So we get a very clear picture with this green, with a, um, highly trained technologies. So like I said, this is a non-invasive test. There's no radiation, no dye. With an experienced technologist, it takes about 15 minutes and it is highly accurate. So you have an aneurysm, you're diagnosed with an aneurysm. Okay, now what? For small aneurysms, those that are three to four centimeters, so a little bit smaller than a ping pong ball, that wall is still pretty thick. So you only need an ultrasound every three years or so, okay? The average rate of growth of an aneurysm is 0.1 to 0.2 centimeters per year. So it's slow. Um, for aneurysms that are four to five centimeters, you need an ultrasound every year because now we're getting thinner. We just kind of like to watch them a little bit closer. And then when they get to five to 5.5 centimeters, you need to go see a vascular surgeon, all right? At that point, we do get a more specific test called a CT scan, which is a tube. You go in and out, it's very fast. You get an injection of dye and it gives us a much better understanding of the anatomy. It basically takes a bunch of different x-rays or a bunch of a series of x-rays. So at that point, once it gets to that size, we get a CT every six months. And that's the recommended screening with the vascular surgeon. So what can you do to prevent progression? Well, not a lot. Unfortunately, if you are smoking, stop. That's the one major thing you can do. Blood pressure control. And one of the biggest things my patients ask me when they come in is, and it's mostly women asking about their husbands to say, I haven't let my husband take out the trash. Since he got this diagnosis, they can take out the trash. They can do it. Um, it it's perfectly safe and healthy to do your normal activities. Stay active, this aneurysm's been there a long time. Normal activity and healthy exercise will not make it bigger. Uh, in fact, if you do come to needing repair, maintaining that health uh, will be critical. So when do you need a vascular surgery? So like I said, when it gets to that five to 5.5 .5 centimeter size, about the size of a, um, a line, you need to come see us. Get screened somewhere between five to um, five point five to six centimeters is when you need repair. Why do you need repair at that size? So, as with anything in medicine, we weigh risk and benefit of treatment and surveillance. When aneurysms are four centimeters, four centimeters, excuse me, the risk of rupture. So this is rupture risk in percent per year, and this is the aortic diameter. So when it's four centimeters, King Kong ball size the risk is almost zero of a rupture. When you get up to 5.5 centimeters, it's about five to 10%. Um, and that is actually when that risk balance goes in the back in favor of doing surgery. And then when you get up to seven centimeters, the size of an orange, um, you're up to 20% per year rupture rate. So that whole bleeding out 80% mortality. So what are our treatment goals? We want to stop blood flow from going through that weakened aneurysm tissue and take the pressure off of that one and prevent rupture. However, we have to continue to have blood flow to your bowels, your kidneys, your pelvis, and your legs, right? So we have to maintain that flow. So how do we do that? So there are two methods. 
One is through an open repair, where we actually all go through all the details um, momentarily, um, where we actually replace the tissue with a graft open and take out the disease tissue, sorry. And then the other um, method is to divert flow via a graft placed inside of the lens. So this is what's called an EVAR or endovascular. And I'll go through all that in detail. So how is treatment determined? Like a lot of things in life, location, location, location. Okay, that's what it depends on. So <clears throat> infrarenal aneurysms, which are aneurysms that occur below the kidney arteries, those are the lowest arteries that come off in your, uh, your abdomen and above the, well, generally above the iliac arteries. These are the most common and actually the easiest to treat. Then you have your juxtarenal and pararenal aneurysms. So these are by your, they go up to your kidney arteries. These are a little more complex to treat, a little less common. And then you have your suprarenal arteries. So these go all the way up through the bowels that go to your intestines, your kidneys. These are hard to treat, but fortunately they're a lot less common. So we'll go through these one by one. So infrarenal aneurysms. So, you know, traditionally we've treated these with open repair. So this means a big incision, basically from here to here, stem to stern, uh, or doing one kind of through the side of your chest. We go in, we get down to your aorta. We go above uh, to where there's healthy tissue above the aneurysm. We cut that aneurysm out. We put a graft in, and then the blood flow is now going from healthy tissue to healthy tissue with this graft replacing that aorta that was unhealthy. What does this mean for you as a patient afterwards? You go to the ICU for one to two days. You have a tube that um, is draining your stomach because we do have to manipulate your bowel, um, which can cause your intestines to kind of freeze up a little bit. You have a Foley catheter that's draining your bladder and an arterial line. These usually only stay in for one to two days. Then you go to the floor. We slowly give you a diet pack. You get that back up on your feet. And discharge, depending on how active and healthy you know you were when you come in, is home versus rehab. Rehab, oftentimes it's home. Now, <clears throat> endovascular aortic repair. So this is that graph. So we go inside your blood vessels, and I'm going to show you a video of it soon. But this this is what the graph looks like. It's a uh, uh, plastic, and then inside it has metal that gives an outward force that helps oppose the graft to the wall of the aorta and helps the blood flow go through this graft and not go in this wall. So this is gonna go through this. So this is um, talking about how we actually put the graft in. So I think this animation is pretty helpful. Um, so this is what it looks like. So the infrarenal aortic aneurysms are kind of around the level of your belly button. And we go in through your groins to put them in. We make this, uh, we go in through what we call a percutaneous method. So very small incisions in your groin. And uh, so we put a wire up from one side. And then this is that graph going in and it's encased in a sheet. That's how they, they pack it and how we can get it up. It's a very small um, introducer to your blood vessel. And you can see here, that this is below the kidney arteries and this is in healthy aorta above the aneurysm. So this is where that outward force is happening on the aorta and where it's sealing. And we come in from the other side. And we place this second piece that you see here. We can kind of speed this up a little bit. So we balloon the whole thing. And then you can see that the blood flow, I think this is really important. So see this blood flow is now going through this graft, which is totally um, closed off and not going into this weak wall aneurysm. Okay. <laughs> 
So this is much easier on you. Okay, as a patient, when you come in for an ER, you're in the ICU overnight. The worst thing is you have to be flat for six hours. This is very frustrating for patients, but we do put, you know, relatively big holes in your arteries and your groin that we just close uh, with a couple of sutures. Um, and so we want those to really heal up nicely before we let you get up and walk around. As soon as you're with it and you can sit upright, we give you a regular diet, you're discharged the next day or the day after that. And then um, you're almost always discharged home. So why wouldn't everybody get that kind of repair? Well, there are trade-offs. So an open repair, it's a one-time fix, okay? You see me, you get the repair, you're in the hospital for a longer period of time, but then I really don't need to see you for another five years. That's the next time you need any type of screening. And most patients don't need any further uh, intervention. So there's, but there is a higher upfront risk. There's a 5% upfront um, risk. You're, you're in the ICU for a long period of time. You're in the hospital for a longer period of time. And it takes six weeks for you to feel normal. You get a big hit of anesthesia. You no, know, it's a big surgery. EVAR, very low upfront risk. One to two day hospital stay. You really feel great by two to four weeks. But you have to have ongoing surveillance. You have to come back and see me every six months to a year. And there's about a 20% re-intervention rate. And what do I mean by that? Well, because we depend on that outward force so for that uh, blood flow to go through the, the graft, sometimes it doesn't work. You can have flow around this. You can out, there are also small blood vessels, uh, lumbar vessels that uh, are very small and feed into the sac that can cause um, leaks. And also there can be leaks between the components. So normally, if we do have to do it a re-intervention, it's something small. But 20% of the time, we do have to do one. So now, pararenal and juxtarenal aneurysms. These are those aneurysms that go up to level of your kidneys. Okay, these are all repaired through uh, for open for that open surgery through a big uh, incision that goes up into your chest. You normally need chest tubes afterwards, um, but it does allow us to do bypasses to your kidneys if we need to, bypasses to your bowels if we need to. Um, this is a much riskier surgery. We often have to clamp the aorta up here so that we can sew down here, meaning we block, block the aorta up there with our clamps, um, thereby depriving your, your liver, your kidneys of blood flow. So it's just a much bigger challenge for your body, a much bigger physiologic challenge. <clears throat> so for these, you're typically in the ICU for two to three days, all the same tubes, they tend to stay longer. You're on the floor for four to six days, advancing your diet and physical therapy. Let's say about half of people go to rehab after this uh, procedure. There is a good repair for this endovascular. Um, it is a, um, FDA approved repair. So like I said, you have to take the graft. If you do a graft from the inside, you have to take it up into healthy aorta. But if you have a pararenal or juxtarenal aneurysm, then that, that aneurysm goes up to the level of the kidney arteries. So you can't put the graft up high without covering those kidney arteries. So the way that we um, achieve a good seal with that is that we make holes for the kidney arteries in the graft. And th this company, Cook, actually does this. They only do this in Australia. So it takes four to six weeks to get these grafts. We can't do it on an emergency basis. And, um, and then we put stent out into the kidney arteries and we put the, and sometimes into the superior mentoric arteries, the superior bowel. And then uh, we put the graft up to this level. So this is a video showing this one. So here you can see again we go into the groin, um, minimally invasive. Now we're putting the graft to cover the kidney arteries, but we have those holes for the kidney arteries. We come up from the other side. We put stents out into the kidney arteries, and we're going to release this and open this whole graft. So just to kind of fast forward. So this is what that looks like closer up. So 
So these are the sense into those kidney arteries. So these are common sense. And we have the blood flow that can go into the kidney artery and it goes in through the scrap and it doesn't leak around it into the And we do the same thing. And these are custom made to your anatomy. So again, then we put a second graph down that goes all the way down to the iliac. And so this is what it looks like at the end. So this is very similar to EVAR graphs, very similar course. So you're in the IC overnight, you're flat for six hours again, you're almost home, always home on day one or two. And the trade-offs are almost the same. So again, open, one-time fix, higher upfront risk. It's higher than an infrarenal. Um, you're in the ICU longer. Uh, your hospital stays longer. And it really does take that full six weeks to feel more. The um, fever graph, very low upfront risk. One to two day hospital stay, two to four weeks of full recovery. Again, we have that ongoing surveillance every six months to a year. And then a 20% reintervention rate. Um, and again, there are more junctions. You have those kidney artery stents, you have the EVAR stent. So where there are more junctions, there's more risk for leaking. And then super renal Same kind of uh, incision, except we often have to go higher. So it's even harder on you. These are very high risk repairs. We often do them in conjunction with uh, our cardiac surgery colleagues. We have, because we, um, because these repairs are more complex and we often have to do bypasses to the arteries to your bowel and kidneys separately or do a patch, we can't leave the aorta, we can't clamp the aorta for that long. So we do have to put you on for, uh, partial heart bypass. So that's why we do with our, um, our cardiac surgery colleagues. This is really mostly reserved for younger patients with connective tissue disease. <laughs> the other big risk of this procedure is that because we do have to go higher, we this is a, a schematic of blood flow to your spinal cord. Uh, we can take out more of the blood flow to your spinal cord, so your risk of um, being paralyzed postoperatively is on the order of two to five percent. What we do to prevent that is that we put in the spinal drain just like you do for pregnant women. Uh, and that decreases the pressure around your spinal cord and decreases that risk. So everything you had before in those other open repairs, except you also have a spinal drain, which means you can't get up and move around for at least 24 to 48 hours. Um, this is at least a two week hospital stay for the most part. And people almost always go to rehab even young patients. <clears throat> However, uh, for endovascular repairs, we don't have any great options in the United States either. Because of the FDA, it's very challenging to get new grafts. Um, there is a graft, um, an experimental graft. It's in a clinical trial. We have it at the University of Florida. We've implanted several of these. This is called the Tambi graft. Um, so the thoraco um, abdominal branch endoprosthesis graft. So basically what this is, is this is, um, this is a graph like what we saw in the EVAR, the, that initial infrarenal repair, but it goes all the way up in the chest. And then there are holes lower down that we can put stents through for the arteries that go to your kidneys and your, uh, and your bowels. And then we put that other graph that goes down to those iliac arteries. This is a really great graft. We've had multiple patients. We've implanted this in multiple patients and they've done really well. The other thing uh, that we can do, and this is compassionate use, so this is not FDA approved, um, but we have the excellent results in our institution, uh, is what's called position modified in the graft, or PMEDS. So this is where instead of a company making the holes in the graft, which um, either takes four to six weeks or it's not available because of your anatomy, um, then we make the holes in the graft. So we do this based on highly advanced 3D software that we have. Um, we determine where to make those holes, then we implant the graphs and we put stents in. So this is kind of what when it's completed. So again, these are very high risk aneurysms, open as a one-time fix, but really that's it's a it's a fixed free reserve for mostly uh, much younger patients with connective tissue problems because much higher risk 
six to eight weeks to full recovery at least. Endovascular, there's low upfront risk, two to three day hospital stay, two to four weeks to full recovery. But again, you have the ongoing surveillance and a 20 to 30% reintervention rate. More junctions, more problems. So um, other considerations. So anybody who has weakened tissues in their aorta can also have weakened tissues other places. So in the iliac arteries where the aorta branches, we do have um, fixes for that with, a, with FDA approved grafts. So where we can preserve that flow to your pelvis through that internal iliac artery. We also can do open repairs for those. So that might be a situation where we would more heavily consider an open repair if you have an iliac artery. And then inclusive disease. This is especially true in women. Women have small vessels. And sometimes even if we wanna do one of the less invasive approaches, we have to do uh, an open um, procedure along with it. That's a smaller open procedure than the aneurysm repair, where we sew on a graft to your iliac artery. Um, and we make just a small incision sew on that graft. And that allows us to introduce to introduce the uh, bigger graft up higher. Because if this vessel is too small, then we can't get it up from your groin up into your aorta. So that's when we do that. And also for people who have uh, symptoms from these uh, or blockages. And then mesenteric occlusive disease. So if you have blockages in the blood vessels that go to your intestines, uh, when we put in uh, endovascular grafts, or even when we do open repairs, um, we take out the inferior mesenteric artery most of the time. So if you have disease in this uh, superior mesenteric um, artery, then we will sometimes put a stent in preoperatively to uh, prevent bowel disease. So, all right. So takeaways. It's really important to get screened. If you're a man between 65 and 75 who's ever smoked, and you haven't had an ultrasound screening for an aneurysm, or you have a family history, go talk to your PCP, get that ultrasound screening. Okay, this is why it's that silent killer, because remember only 15% of eligible people get screened. Follow a surveillance protocol once you've been screened. Make sure to go back. Come and see a vascular surgeon if it gets up there between 4.5 to five centimeters. And there are many options for repair. We can almost always find a way. Um, open is more invasive and more definitive. Um, endovascular is less invasive, but you do have to have that ongoing surveillance. So thank you. Anybody has questions?